So here's some home-based action steps that you can take to improve your nutrition, to improve your vitamin and mineral status. Number one, eliminate processed foods. Ultra processed foods are calorie high and nutrient low. So they're basically a form of empty calories, so to speak. And many of the chemicals in these processed foods we're now finding can contribute to autoimmune conditions. Choose as many organic foods as possible. Now our system's not perfect, so if you have local farmers markets or local farmers that you know and trust, it's always better to buy local from those individuals. If you grow your own food, many of you do, many of you can, many of you want to, um, that's not a bad idea either. But whole foods with as little chemicals in them as possible is the status quo here that we're aiming for. Choose nutrient-dense foods that are easy to digest. These are some examples that you can see, bone broth, organ meats, berries, soups that are cooked down, fermented vegetables, all good things, but any whole food is a good choice. Any whole food without adulterated chemicals is what you wanna aim for. Consider working with a functional medicine doctor. Um, here's some lab tests on nutrition that you can consider ordering. You might wanna screenshot this page. But a nutritional analysis using lymphocyte proliferation or something called INA, intracellular nutrient analysis. There's a test to measure iodine. It's very accurate called an iodine loading test. You can ask your doctor about it. Um, 25 OHD, that's a common test that can be ordered by most doctors and most doctors are willing to order it. An iron panel with ferritin helps you understand your iron better. A CBC and chemistry profile can sometimes lead to a better understanding of nutritional status. There's a test called homocysteine, which is an independent marker that can help understand your B12 and folate and B6 status. Hemoglobin A1C, um, this is a good, not so much because it detects nutritional deficiency, but because it helps to detect carbohydrate um, Overload. If you're eating too many carbohydrates for what you're expanding, generally you're going to have an elevated A1C. You can check for CRP. Uh, in this case, HS stands for high sensitivity. CRP is an inflammatory chemical. Uh, there's another inflammatory chemical called ESR, not on this list you can ask for, but a lot of times with autoimmune disease, doctors are already ordering it. Uh, and then insulin. Insulin is a good marker insurance covers it. It tells you a lot about carbohydrates as well. Are you over consuming carbohydrates? Now, when it comes to nutritional testing of vitamins and minerals, be very cautious about serum lab tests. Um, there are exceptions to that rule, one of them being the vitamin D test. So in the serum, 25 OHD is a really good way to assess vitamin D. And iron and ferritin are a really good way to assess iron. Uh, but when it comes to the other nutrients, serum lab tests are, are wanting, right? Your serum um, levels of nutrients generally are a reflection of your last meal. They change from day to day very rapidly. They don't, um, they don't account for something called liver redistribution. Your liver can store nutrients. And so when your body, when your cells of your body need more of a nutrient, they can call on the liver and the liver will, will pump out its stored uh, reserves into the bloodstream to get to that tissue. And, and if you're drawing your blood when the liver's redistributing the nutrient, you can get a false normal level or in even some cases a false high level. So serum can be tricked. It's not super accurate. This goes back to what's the best way overall to measure nutritional status over time. It's called INA, intracellular nutrition analysis or intracellular nutrient analysis. Um, and again, I'll put a link below and you can read more about that. Now, I was talking about drug-induced nutritional deficiencies earlier. I'm going to pause for just a minute on this screen and pop it up for you. These are some of the more common medications that are prescribed. This is not intended to be the master list of every drug. But if you're on these key categories of medications, screenshot this. This is a good starting place for you in your research and use this as a tool. Okay, let's go down now back to our diagram on triggers for autoimmune disease. We'll go to the far right of this matrix, this autoimmune matrix under gut integrity and dysbiosis. So a lot of people don't realize that eating, the act of eating is the act of warfare. It's you versus the environment. When you eat, food is not necessarily um, 
innocent. There are things in food, even in organic, healthy food. There are microbes and other, other things that we're exposed to. And these things can be inflammatory. Our, the job of our gut is that it's an area where we are quarantined away from the bloodstream. So the gut's role is to take food, to digest and break it down, remove the things that might be harmful or dangerous to the body through the feces, through the poop, and to hang on to the things that are helpful, right? So the gut's basically a long tube that separates good from bad and helps you absorb good. And so the integrity of the gut lining becomes ever critical, especially when it comes to autoimmune disease. There's, in research today, there's a new term. It's called intestinal hyperpermeability. I say a new term, it's 20 years old. Leaky gut is a, is a, is a layman's way of saying intestinal hyperpermeability, and it's a very real and well-documented phenomena and a cause of autoimmune disease. So if you have intestinal integrity issues because you have permeability or leaky gut, understand that the things in your gut can now leak into your bloodstream over triggering your immune system. So your immune system over time becomes more and more hyper-responsive, hypersensitive, and these things leaking in keep your immune system engaged in attack mode. So we want the gut lining to be sealed. 70% of your immune system is right behind your gut wall. It's, there's a name for it, it's called the gastro-associated lymphoid tissue or the GALT. So the gut's responsible for digestion and absorption, the destruction and elimination of toxins, for quarantining those toxins away. The gut also harbors the microbiome. Your microbiome are the, the living microorganisms in your GI tract that help you digest. They also help you make vitamins. They also send messages to your immune system and help regulate its functionality. The gut regulates water and electrolyte balance as well. As I said before, it houses 70 to 80% of the immune system and it connects and communicates directly to the brain. That's why people say I have a gut feeling or I got a gut feeling. That feeling, listen to it, by the way, your gut feeling is usually right. But the gut communicates to the brain through the vagus nerve, a very important communication sequence. And so what you eat is also what you think. And that's very, very important to understand because when you have gut dysbiosis, many people struggle around getting their autoimmune disease under control because of their food cravings. They have cravings for sweets or sugars or processed foods. And this has to do with the gut. It has to do with the milieu or the microbiome in the gut. Certain microbes will hijack your vagus nerve, send messages down it to your brain, make you crave the things that they want but that aren't good for you because if you feed them, they grow and continue to prosper. Whether you prosper or not is not their concern. So keep that in mind. Your gut is, is going to be a very, very important part of the process of resolving autoimmunity. And there's five gut firewalls. If you look at this diagram here, the first is called the GALT, the gastro-associated lymphoid tissue. This is your immune system. This is what I was referring to, 70, 80% of your immune system, that's that. You also have these little unique protein barriers in your gut called tight junctions. Now these prevent your gut from leaking. So these are anchors that, that reside between gut cells that keep those gut cells from separating or splitting open allowing for the contents of your gut to spill into the paracellular space between gut cells and then subsequently make it into your bloodstream. You also have something called mucosal IgA. This is a specialized antibody that acts like a police force in your gut uh, or ha handcuffs, if you will. These IgA antibodies will bind to all different types of toxins and other chemical exposures that you might come across and prevent them from being absorbed into your bloodstream. They will bind to them and then you're allowed then to poop them out. Then we have the friendly bacteria. The friendly bacteria play numerous roles in regulating our gut health. Aside from helping us make vitamins, they help us digest our food, but these friendly bacteria also can process chemicals and detoxify toxins and put them into your stool and poop, help your body poop them out. So the, the friendly microflora is very, very important. Many people who have a history of antibiotic use or have a history of antibiotic exposures through whether it's through chlorine or fluorines or other things in the environment have a diminished flora and this is part of their problem. This is one of the triggers, right, that opens that gut lining and can trigger autoimmunity. And then we also have the stomach acid. The stomach acid is super important and the reason it gets on the top five, there are more 
firewalls in the gut than these five, but these are the top five. But the reason we put acid in the, in the top five is because so many of you are taking antacids. Drugs like Prilosec and Nexium and even the Tums and the Rolaids that you pop before the food that you know is going to upset your stomach. Look, those things block your acid. And the job of stomach acid is to destroy and kill unfriendly microorganisms that you might get by eating your food. The other job of that stomach acid is to break down and help you digest protein. Protein is what your immune system is made out of. The antibodies and the other proteins that you get from the food that you eat go into the functionality of your immune system. So if you're blocking stomach acid on a regular basis, you're going to suffer protein malabsorption and malnutrition, and it's going to affect you in many, many ways. So stomach acid, very, very critical. Okay, let's move on to what I call the four horsemen of the GI apocalypse. You see in this diagram, chemicals. And again, that could be in your food. This is why we try to eat chemical-free as much as possible. Gluten, microbial imbalance, and medication. When you add these four horsemen together, they can create a synergism that can cause and drive perpetual GI damage and intestinal permeability. Now, that intestinal permeability, a.k.a. leaky gut, has triggers. This is an example. If you look at this diagram, these are known causes of leaky gut. As you can see here, gluten can cause it. Think, we know this thanks to the work of Harvard researcher Alessio Fasano. GMO foods, plastics. How many of you eat out of plastics, eat off of plastics, eat with plastic silverware, drink out of plastic bottles, rub plastics on your face through cosmetics and other things? Plastics are no good. Uh, pesticides, Aggressive exercise. Now, when I say aggressive exercise, not moderate exercise, aggressive exercise. We see this a lot in athletes where they're, where they're exercising super, super heavy and they start getting sick as a result. And this can be one of the triggers. We know that many medications can drive leaky gut. Infection uh, can drive leaky gut. Food allergies and sensitivities can drive leaky gut. There's another example. Another example, food there, potatoes. There was a study done. Uh, years ago on a particular alkaloid in potatoes in, in some people, not in all, but in some causing leaky gut. It's an example there. And the reason I don't want to scare people away from potatoes, I have this on this diagram to predominantly give you the example that different foods can cause leaky gut for different people. And one of the elements here that you want to take away is if you suspect food is a trigger for yourself, you m most likely want to consider food sensitivity food allergy testing to get a better understanding of what your food triggers are. So keep that in mind as we go through this. Now, you see this diagram here on leaky gut. Leaky gut occurs when tight junctions are damaged. Those tight junctions are damaged by many different things. But once they're damaged, chemicals and toxins can access your bloodstream. This can lead to immune abnormalities, increases the development of food allergy, one of the things we call acquired food response or acquired food allergy. And that can drive the process of autoimmunity. 